uh, Tracy approached me and she wanted to know if I'd be willing to um, come to watch a video that Fred Brown and I put together a year ago. And I said, sure, that sounds easy, piece of cake. And then she was interested in tide pooling. So I sent her copies of tide pool photos and it was actually videos of two videos of visiting two weeks ago at pretty much Carmel Point. Uh, it's just to the south of the tour house and it's on the right angle turn on scenic. And it's a place I go to when Point Lobos is closed. Uh, the low tides were the lowest of the year, pretty much negative 1.9. And I went two days in a row. I think it was a Tuesday and a Wednesday, uh, June 14th and June 15th. And um, interestingly enough, with Point Lobos Foundation just taking on a new purview that includes the Carmel River State Park, um, we were, I was having a conversation with Tracy and Kathleen just before we started. And it turns out the place where I was tide pooling um, on both of these days is probably just inside the Carmel River, just inside or just outside. It's right near the border <laughs> of the Carmel River State Park. And it has a vantage point to look at both Point Lobos and the Carmel River Beach and the low tides at 5.30 in the morning. And it's one of the prettiest views. I think every time I get at the top of the stairs at Scenic, and I believe it's Ocean View, but I could be wrong. Um, it just takes your breath away. And you'll see those pictures. And um, I wanted to give a thanks to Stephen Jobs. I hope I said his name right. The Apple engineer who designed these phones that all you do is you take your pictures and then the artificial intelligence um, puts it together with music and like photos, and it makes for a big one plus one equals three instead of one plus one equals two. It, it's just a really um, peaceful. Uh, Tracy and I agreed today is going to be like a summer breeze um, presentation for the Point Lobos Foundation series. Um, I'm on my way to see grandchildren down south in San Diego shortly in a few days. I will, I'll be right up next to the Cabrillo Monument and I'm definitely hoping to take two grandsons who'll be together the first time, well, second time in their lives for me. But um, just, I'm gonna, I'll just previewing, before we go into the first video, Tracy, I'm gonna read the poem Beckoning, which was on the original um, Weston Beach. Now that doesn't come in, put it next to my face. Um, the original pamphlet, it got dropped off, but Sue Miller, a Point Lobos docent, wrote it, and I think it, it gives a wonderful introduction to starting our tide pool adventure. But a few details of tide pooling. Uh, number one, you need a, I still use the paper booklet, and sometimes I really like this tide log, and I get the tide log, I'm learning how to do this with a background, sort of learning there. I think I got it now. Well, I'll just do one, this tide log. And it, the tide log shows you um, visually, and I really like to hold it. Uh, that's okay, I'll give up. But I buy it at the kayak store in Monterey. And those of you who aren't in Monterey, if you're on the West Coast or a coast, if you have a kayak store, they have these tide logs. Many people will still use their self, the cell phone and get their tide app on the cell phone. Um, I, kind, I still like the paper product. I have, I can use it easier. So you need to know when the low tide is. You need to know if the place is open. Uh, like for example, when the low tides were negative 1.9 at 5.30 in the morning, I happen to know the hours of Point Lobos Reserve and that it was closed. So you have to find an alternate place to go tide pooling. Those of us on Monterey Peninsula have so much coastline that is free to explore from anywhere to the Coast Guard Pier, all the way along the shore of Monterey North, and then I guess it's called, anyway, Monterey, and then Pacific Grove around the corner to Asilomar into that Carmel. We have so much coastline that we can go tide pooling at, at our, that it's open and available. We're so lucky. 
So then once you have a date and a time and you know the place is open, then um, you might consider a change of clothes in the car in case you accidentally fall in or get too wet. Um, waterproof boots or knee-high boots. Target has a pair for $25 that are will last at least for a dozen times in the tide pools. Um, wear a hat, pr protect from sun. Um, know if the tide is coming in or going out, ebbing or flooding. And what are the rules of the particular, particular area that you're going to? So try to check it out or read any of the signs that are posted um, nearby. And I, I think I covered, um, I think I need to cover safety to your own person, to any um, young person you're responsible for. And that's um, once I was visiting from Stockton and I had three children at the time, I think they were between six and eight. And the Dodge Caravan had a lock on the door, but I didn't lock it. And all three of my children ran out ahead of me. And I was thinking it was a flat beach like Seabright Beach and in Santa Cruz. And I was really unprepared, but there was a woman that I couldn't catch up to him. I learned to use the locks on the vans after that. Don't let the kids run out ahead of me. But the woman had them in her hand and said to me, this is a really dangerous shore. Um, you really got to be careful with your children. So maybe now we have Google Earth. You can check the topography. You can call um, whatever agency around is it. Just try to get a, a handle on where you're going and how safe it is for the children that you have with you. I did work at science camp for um, a whole year with sixth graders and we did take them once a week to the tide pools in up off the San Mateo County coast. And I really, now that I look back, it would, I can't believe that um, nobody really got hurt <laughs> because they look a lot trickier. Weston Beach is a really safe place to go tide pooling. You're really protected from the waves coming from the west, especially if you stay in between what I like to call the chicken wing rock, right? That really just totally protects you. And there's a couple of um, strips of water where if the waves are coming from the south, they, the water volume doesn't come over and get you. So you're unlikely to get thrown. But nevertheless, I use my ears a lot in the tide pools. I'm listening to the waves while I might have my head under a rock. I typically like to go with someone else. Um, sometimes I have gone to this site where we're going to go today by myself, but I told my husband at 530 in the morning, there's walkers. And if I got my boots stuck in a rock crack that I could yell and there's people, I know there's people walking every single day up above me. But typically I like to go with someone else. And, and both of these adventures on the 14th and on the 15th, I was with another person, one of whom is Karen Wagner and she actually has her picture in it. And then I was with Irene Rosen, um, who's now a new eye naturalist friend of mine, and she loves the tide pools. And so I'd like to start to build up to June 14th, the movie by reading um, Susan Miller's um, beckoning poem. And I think it teaches us a lot about going tide pooling. And it's days by the shore, so happy and free, the cool ocean breeze says, come visit me. Small seashore creatures litter the shore. Happy little children want to see more. So much to see, don't be a grouch. Careful where you step or you'll say, ouch. Pick it up gently for a look-see. Put it back where you found it and happy it'll be. Days by the shore, so happy and free, the cool ocean breeze says, come visit me. <laughs> so I think that's a, a, I'll be sure to call and contact Sue Miller and tell her she got an applause for her poem. I sure like it. Is it a good time to start the first video then, Tracy? Let's enjoy the first day. It's the, I believe the 14th of June. One second. Technically challenged.
Welcome back. Thank you, Mary, for sharing your personal video with us, the first of two, which um, it's just so, I watch it over and over. And we will have an opportunity, I'll run, they'll both play at the end if you want to enjoy it again um, at the end of the program. Um, I think we might have a question. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning, I think, of the movie. Vicki, did you raise your hand? The mute, I don't know. Just wanted to add to your caution about tide pooling. Right now, I'm sure you're all, you all know, the black oyster catchers on the shore are having chicks and eggs and just be aware of them and give them space. Thank you, Vicki. I'd just like to introduce Vicki. Um, she's a citizen of Pacific Grove and she's also a researcher at Hopkins Marine Station. And I'm, she's gonna make a few comments later on a particular organism that's in, that is in the second video and it's Anthropura sola or the starburst sunburst anemone, which is a cnidarian. So from those pictures, I, Betty, go ahead. I just have a question for you, Mary. I did see a beautiful sea star. And was that the lonely one or were there some that have been uh, replenished? And just to make sure I understand the question, did you mean the bat star that was red or did you mean the Pisaster mm -hmm. okra, which would be our more typical sea star? Because I can't recall if the, we did see Pisasters. Um, which are the sea stars that pretty much disappeared. The bat stars never did totally disappear. They've been there through the whole die off of the um, starfish. I'm, I call them starfish <laughs> of the starfish since seven years ago. Uh -huh. But yes, each time we did see Pisaster okra and we did see several bat stars. They were in quite a few. Great, wonderful, thanks. It's Vicki, just to, if you know, if you don't know, just say I'm not quite up on it, but it's my understanding the die off of the sea stars, the pisasters, especially, or the 21 legged starfish, um, that they still don't know if it's a virus or what virus it is. Is that correct? That's correct. I think the virus hypothesis wasn't confirmed. Okay. Um, but we don't know what all the factors were. There are probably many causes. Okay, so it's a constellation of um, the environment that happened that caused the big die off and it's not really known at this point. That's a good thing to know. And I hope I answered your question, Betty. Or... Okay. Um, Mary, a quick question. Um, in the first video, what was the tide? Oh, <laughs> what would be what would be an optimal low tide to to for for let's say a a novice tide puller to go out when you're looking at the tide chart? What are you looking for when you're looking for a low tide? You uh, thank you for head. asking that question. I'm going to go to the materials that are on the Fitzgerald Marine Reserves pamphlets and what they say, and they're a San Mateo County combination with a California Fish and Wildlife site. And they say any low tide that it under going south, like from 1.0 down to 0 0.9, 0 0.8 into negative, any negative low tide for sure is a good low tide to go to, but it can even be from zero to one. So they say anything below one. Okay. Did that? answer that question. But why did we go that day at 530? Why was I motivated to get up? Why was Karen Wagner motivated to get up? Why was Irene Rosen willing to drive over from Spreckles? Because it was one of the lowest low tides of the year. And it was, and we, Karen and I didn't ever recall seeing a negative 1.9 low tide in this area. And I'd been here 14 years, but it was really, really low. The other aspect in my preparation that I did do for today is an, another thing to look for when you're planning to go to the tide pools and you wanna know what to expect is look and see how big the waves are. If you have a surfing app or if your spouse does, go on and see how high the waves are predicted. 
And if they're going to be six to eight feet, that's pretty high. The other thing to pay attention to is how spaced out are the waves? Are they um, like when I go sailing and they're high waves and they come really fast? That's a rough, ugly place to be out. And the only time I go sailing is I go around from Monterey to Stillwater once a year. And it really matters how big the waves are and how fast they're coming. And that's not going to be as good, at, even if it was negative 1.9. If there's big waves, lots of wind, and they're coming really fast, it won't be that pleasurable. But the day that we went, the, the tides, there were no waves to speak of, really. They were really low waves, and it was just fantastic tide pulling. Mm -hmm. So did that answer that question, Tracy? Why do you go or when yeah. is a good time to go? And, and I appreciate the wave, um, you adding in the information on the waves because I have been out at Weston Beach when the waves were coming a little faster than I think is optimal. And it, it, and it you're watching that instead of really enjoying the, being still enough to enjoy what you're looking at. Well, you're trying to be safe, yeah, <laughs> not get taken out with and the safe. tide. <laughs> Pretty protected. Western beaches, so I, you know, as you pointed out, it, it's really protected in in um, in the area that we were filming that day too. And, and that would be to the south side of Western Beach, from the midline to the south side. Have we ever had anyone swept out at Western Beach? I've never heard of anything. Not to my knowledge, but I. Um, always wonder about the people that go out to what I call a chicken wing and which is the rock to the furthest west on the south side of Weston Beach and I really don't know what it looks like I'm a little jealous I actually saw the summer adventure kids out there and I thought oh I can go <laughs> you know there's an official activity I need to watch the kids um, but I got there too late I got too slow out to the so I've never seen it but I'd that's pretty precarious. The whole unprotected outer coast of Point Lobos, if you go out close to where the waves are breaking on that edge, it, it's not as safe as being back in the tide pools on Western Beach, which are somewhat protected. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else who knows the coast have any comments on that? Um, I have a few poems, another poem I'd like to read, and the writer of it is here, um, Fred Brown. And part of what, I'm, it's called Ode to the Sea Palm, and Pastelia, I think I said it correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Fred, Pastelia, he may not be here now, but it's the sea palm grows out on the unprotected outer coast. You don't see too many of them, or I don't see too many of them at Point Lobos anymore. If there are any, they're going out on Cypress Grove Trail all the way out to the point, and then looking straight down on those rocks that are out there in the very unprotected, hard um, surf. How, would you um, pronounce, please, the pastelia? Uh, you're muted. As soon as I unmute. Yeah, oh, I'm unmuted. You. Yeah, I think that's close enough. Okay, then it I'll rhymes, say it. It rhymes that way anyway. Do you have it memorized? Would you like to say it or would you like me to say it? I don't have it memorized. Okay, then I would like to say Fred Brown's poem, Ode to the Sea Poem. Pastelia and me have a thing for the sea, though one of us holds it more dearly. It sways to and fro and never lets go. We dance but always discreetly. So I I really like poetry. I'm, I'm, since I'm on a roll, I'm gonna do one more for right now. And this one is from another docent, it's Rick Pettitz. And something inspired him. I think it was the last video that I did and he sent me a little email. And it is this, if tide pooling just makes you wary, it's strange and it's slippery and scary. Well, here's the good news. Just wear the right shoes and explore the cool ooze with dear Mary. <laughs> so if, if um, being a docent does have its rewards, <laughs> your friends who write poems. And I, those of you, we've not had any activities through the pandemic on our 
um, Taipul Docent Poetry Group, but hopefully we can get it started again because it um, really helps with your experience at the reserve. So should we maybe look at the second video? Oh, I'd love to share it. <laughs> and remember to keep an eye out for anything that surprises you, um, makes you curious, and we'll share it afterwards. Well, we got to see them both. <laughs> Sorry. I Sorry, Any comments on either one after <laughs> seeing the 14th twice or the 15th? And if no comments, I'll highlight some. Uh, right from the beginning, I don't know if you knew, but I was up early in the morning, so I'm on scenic at Ocean Beach, and that bench I took from inside the car. And as I went around the point, I took a couple of pictures. And then it started off with, um, I'm talking about the 15th, the second video. There was a nudibranch that was yellow and then a beautiful leather star. And we got to see its tan and reddish colors. Um, then I saw uh, Karen on the muscles. One of my favorite photos in there is a hydroid that looks like a plant. And actually, I looked up what kind of hydroid it was, but and a hydroid happens to be a cnidarian again, and I get a little repetitive. But fortunately, Vicki Pierce and I share the same uh, appreciation for at least the word, but my sailboat's name is cnidarian. And so if a creature is a cnidarian, and that would be like uh, jellyfish and anemones, and then also hydroids. And it looked just like a plant, but it's an animal. And um, then there, did you see the surf grass and it had a little brown spot on it? Well, that was a little limpet that is designed just for the surf grass. 
And I'd never seen one before. I'd seen the particular limpet that we see on a grisia or the feather boa kelp. If you run along this, if you run along the stipe, sometimes you can see the specific limpet for the feather boa, but I'd never seen it on the surf grass before. And that was in that video. And then we saw a lovely whole picture of the Pisaster okra. And that was, there was a second hydroid. And then on the, on the video, when you watch it with a um, cell phone, there's a lined chitin, the beautiful multicolored chitin, and it was moving. Could you see that it was moving? And I just thought that was, I had to take a picture of that and I hope the camera caught it because how often do you see a chitin moving? and such a pretty one. So that was one of my favorite clips. And of course, then comes, I love saying this word, it's, it flows off your tongue, but laminaria. And the kelp, I actually laid it out like I was a hairdresser and I was a photographer doing a, a, a set you know, of photos, but I laid it out and it was in the sunshine. So the laminaria laid, and I think it's called winged kelp it, or I, it reminds me of a laminaria, they're all kind of blades and my brothers were rowers. And so I can see the oars. So any kelp that is long and skinny and has a single stipe or several little heads, they're, called, they're a group called laminaria. And I left out, um, well, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna leave time for Vicky because the sea anemone that we saw that filled up the screen and had little like spokes of a wheel in it. and I get a little confused if it's sunburst or starburst, but she can correct us on that. Um, but we did see the black oyster catcher and I sent this video to Vicki and she was the one that typed back to me and said, did you see the food in its beak or, and it had food in its beak. And I hadn't realized that um, from the picture in the beginning, but definitely that black oyster catcher on that rock. I do not know which um, territorial pair that was where we were but they are all part of the Black Oyster Catcher monitoring program going on through the Pacific Grove Natural History Museum. And we do it at Point Lobos. I do know a lot more about Point Lobos's territories. So it, I, I did my highlights. How about your questions, what you wondered about? And then we do have, um, I just feel so um, excited that Vicki's here and that and maybe we should just go into that. And she'll comment on this particular um, animal that is a sea anemone and it is a cnidarian and you're, they have stingers and I'll stop talking. But I wanted to say pre, before I spoke to her this morning that she discovered it and she has a new way of me speaking about her role with the Anthropleura sola. So you're muted, yeah. I just wanted to say first that it was exciting to see the black oyster catcher with food in its mouth, because that means it's taking it to a chick somewhere. We have a lot of chicks this year. So Sola, uh, we called the sunburst anemone. And the way you remember that, Sola means sun. Um, and it, it's an easy way to remember that it's different from the giant green anemone, which has a very plain face. And Sola always has these radiating lines that are like the rays of a sun. And the other thing Sola means is solitary. It's like a, mm. a solo in music. And that distinguishes it from the aggregating anemone, Anthopora elegantissima, which, uh, is the individuals are small and they occur in clumps. And that's because they keep dividing and dividing and dividing. And Sola does not do that. It's each individual is an individual. Thanks. So sunburst and amity. And they're exciting right now because they're very dynamic. They're changing their range and moving north. They're a Southern species. They, did, they used to be very rare here. And now we see them all the time, all over the place and they're gorgeous. So um, that's been documented in iNaturalist. So if you post photos to iNaturalist, um, sunburst anemones, here they're pretty established, but they're, they only go north to about Bodega Bay. 
and they're increasing there. Uh, every year, they're more and more, and they may move farther north than that. This is, this is still an ongoing thing. The, the shore is much more dynamic than we think. We think when we go out there, this is the way it is. This is the way it's always been. No. <laughs> A question, Vicki, how far south do they go if you said I missed it? So I heard North Bodega Bay. Oh, southern limit is, um, I don't really know. I think it goes down a little bit into Baja, but I'm not sure how far. That okay. coast has not been documented as well. Thank you. Anyone else have questions for, how would you describe your relationship if you were not the discoverer of Anthropleura sola? Oh, yes. I would never call myself the discoverer of Anthropleura sola. It's been there for a long time. People have been aware of it, but they didn't know what to do with it because it's very closely related to Anthropleura elegantissima, the little aggregating anemone. They're called sister species. And it's all, and the giant green anemones are also very close and they've been mixed up forever. But more than half a century ago, people were trying to sort it out and only with gen new genetic um, techniques has it been really separated. It's only a few genes different. And um, so Elizabeth Francis and I, another, female anemone lover, <laughs> um, documented it and described it and published a name and description. And we also published Sunburst as the common name. And that's, that was our, our role. So now people know what, what SOA is. Well, I feel like I'm on a NOVA program. Um, Carol, we can get you unmuted so you, you'll be next. Um, so my thought was, is it true that the organism you studied is right off Carmel Point also, the one that you took the genetic material from? Well, the, no, the type, the genetic material was not my study. It was another study. It was done along the entire California coast, a thousand miles. Um, the one that was actually named and deposited as the official specimen was from Sotel. Oh, okay. They're, they're, they're all around the bay. Um, yeah. Did you have a question, Carol? And yes. welcome, by the way. It's Thank great you. to see you. Beautiful program. I'm wondering if we could see that second video and you narrate it at the same time. Ah, <laughs> I'd be willing to try if that's yeah. possible. Well, maybe at a point you could speak in when we see them so that everyone knows what they're looking at. It's a, I think it goes pretty quickly. Um, it does go very quickly. I could highlight ones that are obvious. I'll miss some, but I, I'll try. But whatever you could would be yeah. helpful. Thank you. Yeah. If, Let's give it a, and Don? Yes, uh, back to the second video um, on the moving chitin. Yes. It, I was surprised at, relatively speaking, at how fast it was moving. You could tell by its size and by the shadows and the sunlight. And I guess I always assumed that uh, they, chitons were sedentary like an abalone. How often do they move? I'll, I'll, do you know, Vicki, can you answer? I don't know. I've not seen it like that before. And well, they have, they have to move because they're scraping uh, algae from the rocks. And so when, when they're feeding, they move around on the rock and abalones do too. I thought it was almost like a ballet in a way, the movement. I was trying to imagine their stomach foot moving or rolling. Almost, I'm from Stockton, they developed the caterpillar tractor there. So I was kind of just thinking as the um, gastro, uh, the foot undulating and that word I've seen sometimes, there had to be some undulation, it was so smooth. Yeah. 
And besides, it's again, strikingly beautiful. The line chitons, you know, you can look at Big Katie, it has an interesting name and um, other chitons names, but I just think the line chiton is so pretty, especially if you see it in the low zone, especially if you see it with the, um, with the pink plant, the, now the name escapes me, but the coral and algae, which it lives in amongst, so you can't see it, it's hidden. And it, it's just so pretty. So let's, let's look at it again. Right to where the Carmel River should be coming in. Leather Star, that's a nudibranch. I don't know the name. That's five ribbed chitin. I wish I knew that one. This is Karen Wagner on mussels. That's a Pisaster okra leg. That's a tunica of some sort. This is the hydroid. That's us playing, or me playing with my camera. This is the surf grass with the limpet. Aaron being happy. And the Pisaster okra. That's another hydroid, so it was an animal. That's the black oyster catcher with the meat in its mouth. Those are line chitons. Those are tunicates. That's feather boa. Here's the moving line chiton. That's so thola. That's the laminaria I laid out. That's a red algae. That's a half a picture. It's not the best picture of the electric light bulb tunicate, but it, that's probably what it was. That does move fast. <laughs> I'll, sh I'll share as sort of a wrap up, um, the Carmel River State Beach, you can picnic, it's not a reserve. And one of the comments we did before the movie is just a way of expressing to our visitors to Point Lobo State Natural Reserve that if, if the reserve is crowded, you can, there are other places, there are close by. Thank you, Vicki, for um, participating with us and making your comments. It's so special to have you with us. Very much so. Thank you so much. Does it, well, have a wonderful day. Thank you everyone for being here. If you have any questions, any additional comments, please feel free to send an email. Um, I'm happy to pass it on to Mary, or if it's something I can answer, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us and have a wonderful day. Hope to see you out in the tide pools. Absolutely. Bye.